friends, it's Teresa and welcome back to my channel. Today's video is going to be me talking on the books that I read in the month of September. I read a total of five books this month. Two books were ARCs, one was an ebook that I borrowed somehow from the library, and then two of the books are physical books. So let's just kind of get into it because like knowing me, I will probably still have a lot to say no matter what I try to do. The first book I read last month was actually one of the bind-ups that I said I was going to read for my month to reread, and that is Balefire by Kate Tiernan. This is a YA paranormal, like, urban fantasy kind of romance deal, following these two twins, Cleo and Thais, who literally did not know each other existed until one day where Cleo and Thais' father, who Thais is living with, is killed, and Thais has to move to New Orleans with this family who she's never really realized existed. And on top of that, they're witches. There is a plot including immortality and some mystery regarding around the person who might be trying to kill the twins because of their abilities in like their coven, their familial, however they want to put it. I gave this a 4 out of 5 stars. I believe my actual rating for this was a 3 out of 5, but I bumped it up to a 4 purely for nostalgic reasons. I really enjoyed this book. I love Kate Tiernan's writing, especially in first person. It's such a wonderful way for her to write the story. I think that my biggest problem for this was that some plot points for this book needed a bit more of fleshing out. We didn't get to really see how things wrapped up by the end of the book and it's very clear after the fourth book, Necklace of Water, this was supposed to be a setup, the end was supposed to be set up for more books but we never seemed to got it. So it was, I felt a little unsatisfied by the ending. I also had a weird... So the thing is, when I read paranormal romances, I am very aware of the fact that there's going to be a large age gap between the love interest and the main character, or vice versa. It's just kind of the way the cookie crumbles and like I don't expect it to change. Not because it's creepy in any way, but literally there's no pizzazz if there if it's just like two teams, two actual teams trying to figure things out. There has to be some kind of other element to it. However, my problem with this was that these two characters are immortal. One is stuck in the body of a 15-year-old and it's over 260 years old, and the other one is stuck in a 13-year-old. The 13-year-old being a lesbian or a bisexual. I don't remember. They never really stated the sexualities of the girl, so I can't really, really explain it, explain that to you. But they are queer in some way, and my biggest issue with that weird age gap, not between those two characters, but between their love interests, was that it was mentioned a lot of the times how young they looked. It was like, oh, it's a weird thing that he looks so young. I mean, yeah, I'm attracted to him and it's weird, but it's he's technically older than me, but he's so young. And they talk about like all the ways that they are, you know, the young baby face, the very like unmatured body. Same thing with the 13-year-old. She was in a relationship with someone who was older than her who was also immortal. And like I said, that normally doesn't bother me. But for the fact that they had to have a conversation about why the older girl didn't want the 13-year-old to age was because she didn't want her to die and went through really great lengths and very codependent lengths to change that other person's wishes. And the 13-year-old had to literally point out we literally can't be together in public because you will be seen as a pedophile if he even tries to so much hold my hand. Which I was like, I understand the, the age gap, but I feel like when you have to mention that your love interest is going to be seen as a pedophile if they're seen holding a 13-year-old's hand or even try to kiss a 13-year-old in public, then maybe we should have adjusted the age just a little bit. Especially since that plot point was never really come to fruition or really develop. And on top of that, it was the only, I believe, queer relationship in this book. And it was very codependent. And on top of that, again, with the pedophile aspect, I was like, I get it. You guys are adults. Mentally, you guys are adults. Physically, you guys are kind of stuck in the younger body. But, like, I found it a little troublesome that this was the only queer relationship and it was codependent, low-key kind of toxic, and then also had the themes of it being like, oh yeah, you will be seen as a pedophile because I am stuck in a 13-year-old's body who has not even gone through puberty just quite yet. So I'm just sitting here like, I get it, paranormal romances, we got those age gaps, and I, I really don't give a damn under normal circumstances. But for some reason, these like age gaps in this particular book just rubbed me the wrong way. And I was like, okay. Thankfully, like they fixed the age gap problem between the 15 year old and his love interest because eventually the two immortals had started losing their ability to stay immortal. They were slowly aging, but still 
the fact that it was something that was constantly brought up and like yeah it was just a little weird for me but under normal circumstances i don't give a damn about the age gap in paranormal romances this one in particular just like something about it just did not sit right with me and i didn't even realize it when i was reading this book when i was younger how troublesome the age gaps and the constant mentioning of this age and this problem was especially since certain aspects of that gap and the plot points of the problems that came with it never really saw its end if that makes sense the next book that I read is another bind up and that is Sweet by Kate Tiernan. We have the first three books, which is Book of Shadows, The Coven, and The Blood Witch. This is another YA urban fantasy this time, not so much paranormal romance, but urban fantasy about Morgan Rollins whose life changes when the mysterious Cal Blair comes into her life and introduces her to the world of Wicca. I give this a 5 out of 5 stars. The actual rating is more of a 4.5, but again, bumped it up because of nostalgic reasons. I really enjoyed this book. I love getting back into this world, and I can definitely see how, like, 16... No, I read this when I was in middle school, actually. How, like, 13-year-old Therese really identified with Morgan, primarily because of, like, the concept of her being a really plain girl and, like, not really fitting in with her family and, like, you know, all the teen angst things that kind of come with... You know, puberty. I really enjoyed the love interest Cal, even though I know he's a complete and total dirtbag by the end of the series. Actually, I think by even like the end of the second or third book, complete and total dirtbag, and we hate him. But in these first three books, adore him, love him to tears. I also really enjoyed kind of the plot twist and how like the author made it so there was a perfectly good reason why she didn't fit in with her family and why she felt kind of off from everyone else and it wasn't just because you know she was just awkward playing girl trying to fit in with the world it was because she was adopted and had she not been adopted would have involved her having magic and living in in the wicked terms my biggest issue with this book and the one thing that kind of bugged me about it was the trope that the two girls the main character and the best friend fight over the boy, who in this case is Cal, and both girls end up choosing the boy. I understand kind of how this happens because I've read the books prior and I know that Cal did a lot of manipulation in order for both girls to be pitted against each other and they do talk it out. But I do think in certain instances it was an a case where like I feel like they could have just sat down and have been open with each other. But like, you know, this is like written in the 1990s. Open communication between friends was not a big trope in, in media just quite yet. So I understand. But I really enjoyed this and I'm really sad, like I said in my vlog, that I didn't get a chance to pr continue on with the rest of the series because I didn't really have to introduce one of my favorite characters in the first three books. I thought he was introduced later on. So I was like, you know, I'm not in any rush. He doesn't come in. And then he comes in and I'm sitting here like, oh, well, this is a problem, but I'm hoping that maybe in the future I'll do another rereading month and reread through the last few chunks of these books, and I won't be such a huge slump that I can't finish them, you know? The next book that I read was actually an ebook that went through in my library, and if you guys have seen my vlog that came out annoyingly this morning, this afternoon, which shouldn't have happened, that is After Ever Happy by Anna Todd is the last installment in the After series, which, you know, if you guys don't know what that is, more power to you, but that is the Harry Styles fan fiction that became a best-selling novel that eventually became a movie series. And I have read all four books and I've seen the movie, and um, annoyingly enough, the movie was not better than the book. <laughs> I think anyone who's seen the movies can attest to the fact that like most of the grit that came from the first book and the series in general was absolutely gone, even though it's a very toxic situation, but we're not going to get into that. I ended up giving this book 2 out of 5 stars. So when I first read After, I had no plans of continuing on with the series. Just because I was like, it's really toxic and I'm just not a fan of it. But I got really intrigued just because it's like a train wreck kind of a book. You can't help but really watch what's going on, even though you should just be driving by. You know, you just have to look to see what happened. So I read the fan fiction on Wattpad, which is still available, and there were a lot of discrepancies between the books. Not like changes, but things were just cut off differently, we got rid of certain point of views, uh, things were adjusted but not too much, it was basically just a copy-paste. All we really did was adjust where certain books end and certain books start. So I read through basically the entire trilogy at the time through Wattpad. And I was like, okay, well, I don't need to read the fourth book. It's not a big deal. I know kind of what happens in this one. And then I got curious. So I borrowed the fourth book and it finally came out. So I, 
I was like, okay, let's just try to, you know, it's a crappy book. I feel like if we push through it, it'll break through some of our reading stuff a little bit, get out of the mentality of fantasy books and whatnot. Turns out, lots of the fourth book were part of the third book on Wattpad. So I literally just had to skim through most of the book and then read the ending. And I knew what happened. But like I said, it's a 2 out of 5 stars. I thought this is like I said, a train wreck kind of a read. It's a interesting kind of quick read to read through if you're like in a slump or just want to see some bad writing and see like make yourself feel better about yourself if you're a writer. Kind of bad I know, but you know, what you can do about it. Ultimately, the series is terrible. It's a very toxic and unhealthy relationship. And I think the only saving grace, there are two saving graces about this book actually. One is a smut. The smut is actually pretty okay, you know? Pretty okay. Not the best I've read, but not the worst. I think the worst still belongs to Fifty Shades. The other saving grace is the fact that like throughout these books, Hardin does try to change a little bit for the sake of like having a proper relationship, a non-toxic relationship with Tessa. He does go to therapy and utilizes other ways to bring out his temper. And that's kind of the one saving grace that I have out of this entire series is that unlike some other really shitty books that have abusive exes and abusive boys, hard and tried which is like bare minimum really but like when you're reading this book as a young child and you're reading bad boys I suppose it's a good thing that he tried you have like a baseline for the standards you may have set for your future partners so we have that but overall would not recommend unless you really want like a nice like laugh and you need to see how smut works in certain books that's about it I am kind of excited to see the second movie though because I feel like it brings up more of the grit that we see within Tessa and T Hardin's relationship and they talk more which is always nice because they didn't barely any talking in the first movie and I just kind of sat there like so am I just gonna watch y'all breathe? The last two books that I have are actually ARCs and thank you to NetGalley for approving me for said ARCs. I'll, I swear I'll have those um, reviews up soon. The next book is from Darkest Seas by Rosalind Chase. This is an adult romance novel following an ex-detective who moves into this cabin that this lady is moving out of, trying to kind of find himself after his wife's death. I ended up giving this a two out of five stars. Content warning if you want to pick up this book, let me just pull this out. There is murder, death, and serial killers. It's, they're not really huge parts of the um, books per se, like they don't, they only really appear in certain scenes, but it's still something that you should probably, you know, keep in mind. I was interested in this book, you know, I'm trying to get more into the adult romance genre. I think they're interesting. So I picked up this arc because I was like, you know what, why not? It seems interesting. And it also involves Selkie mythology. By the end of the book, I realized I was not really interested in the main characters budding romance, which spoiler alert, turns out to not really be much of a romance. It was more like a lustings type of situation. And they ended up just kind of like screwing each other and going on separate ways. Cause you know, they were both mourning and it was just a lot of pining and mourning uh, for the people that they lost and then each other, which I was like, okay then. I found myself more interested in the backstory relationship, primarily with the Selkie because she is in a polyamorous relationship. Other than that, Everything else just kind of dragged on and it did not help marrying slump. Though I did give it bonus points for the inclusivity. We have a, like I said, a polymorph relationship, which is MFM. We have a side MM relationship and then a backstory slash side FF relationship. So like, it wasn't terrible. I just think that like there was just a lot going on with the book. And the main fantasy aspect that I was hoping for and the relationship aspect that I was hoping for didn't really happen. And finally, the last book that I read in September is another arc, and that is Vampires of Portlandia by Jason Tannimore. This is a new adult paranormal novel following this family of Aswang, which is part of the Filipino mythology, uh, which is a vampire in this, in this version of events. But when I grew up, I did not think that Aswang were vampires, so I could be wrong. They had moved to Portland after being run out of the Philippines and are trying to find a way to hide in plain sight. But now, as things are happening, they're finding out out that there are a bunch of murders happening and it's all starting to point to them. Trigger warning, lots of death. Lots of it. Lots of death. I ended up giving this a 3 out of 5 stars. I really enjoyed the plot and the premise of the book. I thought it was super interesting and I wanted to read more about Filipino mythology just because I, I have not read enough about it. I don't know enough about it. Overall, the things that got me on this book, I mentioned it a lot in my last two vlogs, was that the writing style was a little too much. There was a lot of descriptions 
And while I do like flowery writing and really descriptive heavy writing, some of the descriptions got really repetitive. I felt like we were being told everything at some point instead of being shown. It left very little to the imagination in not the best way. I also felt like there was too much going on. Way too much going on. There were so many different plot points and threads happening that by the end there was this huge plot twist and I was like... I mean congratulations, you're having like the brand new leader for the Aswang but also, when did you two have sex? So I was just very much like, what's going on here? Way too many plot points and I really couldn't keep track of it. And by the time I was done with the book, I felt like it didn't really have a satisfying ending for me to like wrap it up. It just kind of happened and I was like, okay, that's the end, time to move on. But I am really excited to see where Jason and Tana more take their writing in the future. I don't know their pronouns. But where their writing goes in the future and I'll be sure to pick up more of their works when they come out. I just think that this book was just not the book for me which you know it happens. But that is it for my September wrap up. I did get through quite a bit of books this time. And if you didn't count the bind ups as one big book, I technically read more than five. I read 10. So if you guys have any questions about the books that I've read or want, if you guys have read it, what are you guys' thoughts? But until next time, hit like, subscribe, comment. All of my social media links will be down below and I'll talk to you guys in the next video or everywhere else. But until then, I hope you guys are having a wonderful week. Bye.